So Catherine, if ERM is working really well, what types of decisions should be informed by the ERM process? You know, Sim, I'd say ideally you want almost all your key business decisions informed by ERM. Um, certainly any kind of merger and acquisition activity, um, anything that involves putting um, values around your assets and liabilities in your financial reporting, um, any kind of key modeling activity, I would say um, the development of new products, the any sort of novel distribution of those products, um, pricing, um, terms and conditions around major contracts, um, and perhaps most importantly of all, um, the development and approval of strategic plans should all be things that are informed by risk management information and by the ERM practices in the organization. So most ERM programs have, have not gotten there uh, in informing sure. many decisions, and, th and there's lots of reasons why. Uh, one of the reasons is that many ERM programs just look at extreme downside risk or only downside volatility but a, but a range, and to actually have a process that's going to inform decision making, one of the things you need is you need to look at a range of scenarios, not just the downside but all the upsides. And when you do that across all the risks and you have an integrated view of if we make this decision, this is what we're going to get and this is the volatility around it versus we have another opportunity here and that's the volatility around it, that's information. But looking at volatility agnostically, whether it's up or down versus plan, that gives us an ability to inform decision making. Can you comment on that or to what degree you think in the insurance sector uh, companies have gotten to that point or using that kind of an approach? Yeah. I, I actually think the insurance sector is, is quite a bit ahead of many other sectors in that regard because fundamentally we, we deal in risk. So as we look at different types of risk and aggregate those throughout the, the group, um, we develop a view of how much volati volatility we can tolerate and where volatility might, from one source, might possibly be partially mitigated by volatility from another source. So all that information helps us develop a risk appetite for different types of risks throughout the organization and that then informs the planning process. And what happens in strategic planning is that you can tune your plan to say, you know, I want a little more of this kind of risk and a little less of that kind of risk because it's going to improve the overall level of volatility, make those results a little more predictable. And I think that's really one of the ways that ERM and, and risk managers in particular add value to the organization to be able to do that and look at judicious ways of combining risk in order to get a better, more stable result. So you, you've talked about strategic types of decisions and strategic planning as well. I often uh, say, and I see this occasionally, where the uh, chief risk officer is actually either the head of strategic planning or has a tight connection to strategic planning or is a former head of strategic planning. And I, I always say I think that's a great marriage because they really are, the, I, you know, I, I often talk about the fact that there's a lot of different vendors trying to sell the traditional risk management services under the guise of ERM and, and kind of poisoning the phrase of ERM. But I, I often say if the phrase enterprise risk management ever disappears or dies, uh, I would still do the work, the same work I do now, I, but I would call it dynamic strategic planning. It's just a rigorous way, a more rigorous way of conducting value-based management, strategic planning, or dynamic strategic planning. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think that's fair. I mean, ultimately, that's really what we do as risk managers and how we add value to the organization. Um, and one of the things that occurred to me is, as you were talking about that is I think it's really, really important to get some cross-pollination of people coming out of the business, working in the risk management function, and vice versa. So to truly be able to add value as a risk manager or a chief risk officer, I need a really deep understanding of the business. I need to understand how things are connected and how doing something over here is going to affect something over there. And to think through all those consequences, I don't think you can do that in a silo. And perhaps even more important is to have people that have actually spent time thinking about risk and working in risk and working in ERM, moving into the business 
and actually being responsible for the business decisions rather than the risk decisions. And they take with them that culture to make decisions that are well informed by risk. Mm. I think that's really, really healthy for the organization. So it's interesting. I don't know if anybody's done a study to look at chief risk officers, those that have maybe held a position for a while or some other measure of success uh, with implementing enterprise risk management. Look at their look at their background. There's various different skills they may need to have, but specifically the background having been peppered with different aspects of the business, being not just in corporate, but also in the businesses, understanding both sides of the equation. And you're talking a lot about the setup, right? In advance, uh, we need things to work. We need a cross-pollination of ideas and people that have both perspectives. Also on the back end, I hear from uh, clients that have implemented this that, that there's so much value in the dialogue that takes place after an effective ERM program is set up, both vertically and horizontally in the organization. They say that kind of information sharing uh, spontaneously, voluntarily, but also through the committee structures that are set up to share that information, best practices, what do we learn, what to watch out for, uh, just that kind of connective tissue uh, across the organization adds a lot of value. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, the role of the, the risk manager as part of that second line of defense is to be the independent verifier and the challenger. Um, to really make that work well, it, it can't be all negative. It can't be, if you do this, this bad thing will happen. <laughs> or, you know, why would you, why would you ever want to go there? You know, if, oh, it's horrible. <laughs> and, um, you know, to engage in that really constructive dialogue, you have to be able to imagine yourself wearing the other person's moccasins. You know, and you have to think about, well, what could you do that would improve the business? You know, how do you capture upside? How do you capture opportunities while mitigating, you know, possible bad downside effects? And I find that's where, that to me is where the real excitement is. When you see the changeover from the old traditional way of risk management, which is, you still need silo risk management. There's no question. It's deeper, um, you know, it goes way, way down the organization. It's still going to exist, but enterprise bringing it together it takes the good work that risk folks know how to do, but translates that language into a risk reward mentality, a true business support, business decision making mentality, because it's not just the downside, it's looking at the opportunities and the upside in a disciplined way, and putting it on the same footing to be able to speak that, that language of risk and return. And then those folks get that pulled in, and there's that pull from the businesses, oh, you've helped me make this business decision, you're not a blockade anymore of just looking at the downside, and now I want you at the table helping me make the best decisions so I can actually achieve my goals. Yeah, absolutely. And, and some of the most difficult things are really to form that true partnership with the business. You know, so that you're invited into the inner circle and your opinion is valued and you can add to the dialogue. And, and the other sort of difficult thing for the risk manager to cross is to be able to communicate risk information in a in a friendly, digestible, non-technical manner. Mm. Um, and that's more difficult than it appears given the, the nature of the numbers that we're crunching and, and the statistical nature of things. Um, if your message can't be taken in and, and digested by senior management, it's not gonna be heard. So you're mentioning a lot of different things about uh, the ability to get ERM to inform a range of decisions. As you said earlier, it should inform all the major risk reward decisions you're making, from M&A to strategic planning, strategic decisions. You need a lot of different things to make that happen. You need the right approach, you need respect for the business, you need to have a cross-pollination of ideas, and you need also not just the business uh, understanding and tech some technical understanding, but also the human equation. Knowing how to interact with people and bring them into the process and communicate messages down, across, and up and outside the organization the way that it's going to be effective. So, exactly. So you, yeah. so you did talk about starting with the ideal world and the best possible ERM. Right. So all those things have to be working on all right. those levels. So you, I think for most companies, you set a high bar. And uh, I thank you for your thoughts today. Thanks very much, Sim.